Thanks for streaming on in here on Birds 365 with Mac and Mac. We've got our buddy Mike Sielski from the Inquirer and WIP. Good enough to join us. Mike, I'm sure you already thought you'd be turning that page. Billy said spring training. Come on. And for the Sixers, Joel and B, when's he coming back? Flyers. The Eagles never stop, do they, Mike? They give us content for days, Jody. It's wonderful. I was yeah. going to the Sixers Bucks game yesterday. And then I talked to an editor or two at the Inquirer, and they're like, yeah, we probably need a little bit more on A.J. Brown. So, okay, happy to suffice. Yeah. God bless A.J. for doing that for us. Yeah, I thought the coaching staff would be the big story on Friday. And then, bang, A.J. makes the phone call, Mike. So did a great column. Um, what he got right, what he got wrong. So give us the uh, Reader's Digest view of it. Yeah, honestly, John, you wrote a terrific piece about this for SI.com, too. This is the kind of topic uh, of which PhD dissertations are made, right? <laughs> the relationship between the media and the people who are covered by the media, whether you're talking about pro athletes or politicians or local government or the Philadelphia restaurant scene. And it, my feeling is this, I think, and I've written this before uh, in a previous column about AJ. I think AJ would do well to log off of his social media. I think he is a good person and a good teammate who is spending too much time taking in what is written and posted and said about him and taking a little bit too much of it to heart. Uh, and I think he'd do well just to say, you know what, I'm not going to pay attention to this anymore. Um, that's one aspect of this. The other yeah. is... And you got into this, John, and what you wrote, the changing dynamic of the media uh, and who is the media and how a Twitter poll question by WIP, which is usually the kind of stuff of barroom sports debate and hypotheticals. Hey, if you had it, would you trade this guy for that yeah. guy in, in the social media machine transforms into a genuine trade rumor that AJ gets asked about. Yeah. And it was Kay, Kay that. Adams. Yeah. yeah. Kay Adams asked him, is it, where's this rumor? It was no rumor. There was, there was no rumor. No. The Eagles aren't trading AJ Brown. No. They don't want to trade AJ Brown. Even if they wanted to trade AJ Brown, they really couldn't trade AJ yes. Brown because the salary cap hit would be so high. So it, it, there's just a stew of stuff there. And the other dynamic I think that is worth mentioning and that I didn't get into in that much depth in the column is that I do think that more and more athletes nowadays do presume that those of us who cover the team yes. or their team yes. are going to be on their side. And I hinted at this with AJ and AJ hints at this in the interview we had with Ike Reese and Jack Fritz. Oh no, he didn't I hint. Think. He said it. You're yeah. supposed to be supporting yeah. the team. Yeah. Right. And and back in the 1980s and 1990s and even in the 2000s when I started out, most athletes understood that there was a an objective or adversarial relationship between the media and the athletes and the teams. There were homers, there were TV stations and outlets that were rah rah sis boom ba. But more athletes understood that somebody like me or you guys or a Jeff McClain was coming at it from a D detached objective perspective. Now you have a ton of media outlets, many of which are not in the locker room with these guys that are openly rooting and supportive. And there are many more of those than used to exist back in the day. And so many more athletes think that that's the perspective and stance that you are automatically taking. And uh, speaking just for myself, I don't look at it that way. I like AJ personally. I think he's a terrific player. But if A.J. Brown messes up on the field, my job is to say that A.J. Brown messes up on the field. And if someone in my position thinks that A.J. Brown deserves to be criticized for not speaking to the media after a couple of games, then someone in my position is going to say that. And he and other athletes ought to understand that, too. So uh, John and I debated this a little bit earlier. From an all-encompassing perspective, not just A.J., not just Mike Sielski or Jody McDonald, John McDonald. For the media, for the Eagles, for A.J. Brown, and for the fans, good thing or bad thing, A.J. picked up the phone and called WIP. I heard your point about social media, and you got to put the Twitter down, A.J. I think we all agree on that one. 
But this wasn't Twitter. This wasn't just responding to someone taking a shot or trolling on Twitter. This was picking up a phone, calling Jack Fritz and uh, Ike Reese and having a 20 plus minute conversation back and forth. It's not the same, but it is something that you can look at as a whole and judge after the fact. Good thing or bad thing for most people involved that AJ decided to uh, pick it up and dial. I, I think on the whole, it's an okay thing, Jody, uh, because I do think we can get caught up in thinking that everyone who follows the Eagles is on Twitter and social media all the time. That's and that true. is not the case. Yeah. Yes. Most people have lives that they are living and they are listening to WIP in their cars or they're listening to 97.5 or they're flipping on the TV after a day of work or they're glancing at inquire.com or ESPN.com for a couple of minutes during their lunch break. And they are not immersed in this in the way we are. And if AJ speaks to those people, that's okay. And I think it came off generally pretty well. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not somebody who looks at that and thinks, Oh, he's so sensitive or he, he is sensitive. He's a very sensitive guy, but I don't think he came off as a whiner or anything like that. I think on the whole, it was okay. And I'm, I'm generally in favor of athletes being more open with us, uh, you know, given my choice. Yeah. Always, by the way. Yeah. Prefer openness. So that part of it, a hundred percent agree. You've given me a lot of entertainment over the years, Mike, uh, battling with flyer fans specifically, uh, the media literacy aspect of this, the, the, and, you know, I get it from a fan perspective at times, but the assumption that, you know, Mike Sealski's checking in with me or I'm checking in with you or Mike's checking in with Jody Mack, we're all the same. We're all the same. The Philly media is trying to <laughs> torpedo the Philadelphia Eagles and A.J. Brown. Why is that so difficult for people to parse that there is no monolith, there is no giant conspiracy, there is no weekly meeting where we're saying, ah, Eagles are doing too well. Let's take this down, Mike Sealski. Because I think, John, nowadays, most people don't have, whether we're talking about sports or anything else, a particularly um, diverse array of sources from which they're getting their information. Generally speaking, people like to go to certain spots to hear, I think, too often what they want to hear. And you see this in sports, you see this in politics. Uh, that's the reason cable news exists and the reason it sticks to the format that it does. And I think with respect to the Eagles, there are a lot of uh, influencers or websites or places like that where people can go and hear what they want to hear. And what they want to hear is that the Eagles are great. The person who's producing the content wants the team to do well. And that person is going to criticize the team or a player only when things go bad for that team or player and, and is expressing frustration about the fact that the Eagles are not playing well. And I think that's kind of a subtle thing that gets missed that people in our position sometimes are going to be critical of the Eagles, even when they're winning, you know, it, to somebody like me, I don't care whether the Eagles win or lose. I genuinely don't. I grew up a fan. This job has kind of wrung a lot of the fanness out of me. Oh, because of certain, quickly, by the way. yeah, because of certain <laughs> demands of the job, you have to file a column on deadline, yeah. and you have to find the right story or angle to take, and you have to, you come up in the business saying you're not supposed to be a fan. You're supposed to find the story or the angle that is interesting or needs to be said, and sometimes that cuts against the zeitgeist or the. Uh, tenor of the way everybody else is looking at the team. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're trying to write something just to get a reaction. It means that your job is to be the person who looks at the Christmas tree and it's beautiful. 99% of it is beautiful, but the star on top is just a little askew. And it's your job to point that out. Hey, it's just a little askew. It could be better this way or that way. Um, so there's that. I also think that people talk about the media when there is no such thing as the media. No. No. Uh, there isn't, but I also think that when, and I think AJ falls into this too, when people say the media, whether it's AJ Brown or just a regular average consumer of stuff, 
the media equals anyone who talks on television or talks on a show like this or talks on talk radio or has 300,000 Twitter followers uh, or anything. John Stewart is the media. Jeff McClain is the media. Oprah Winfrey is the media. This influencer on YouTube or Instagram is the media. And that all gets lumped together. And all of those people have different jobs and different roles. And people don't take the time, and, and I don't blame them for this, to parse what each of those people's jobs are and how they're different. Um, Mike, you made some great points there. And I, I understand and relate to a whole bunch of them. But it's funny because it's one thing that's different. You said something. And John said the same exact thing earlier in the show. And I I am a little different than both you guys because actually of the position I'm in. I used to go into locker rooms and do interviews and go to games and stuff like that. And when that was the case, I couldn't root for a team because I felt if I did, that I'd get to know the people and I'd root for them and I couldn't give an honest opinion on the air. When I was able to back out of that, I don't ever go to any games. I'm always here in my studio at home and never attend an Eagle game anymore, unlike you guys. Oh, I can say I root for the team. Then when I turn the mic on, I take myself out of that. And I could objectively say, here's my opinion on the Philadelphia Eagles. When I was around them, I couldn't do that. I couldn't say, well, I'll be objective when I get on the air. No, because I know the guy, because I like the guy, because I want to root for the guy. So I had to divorce myself from rooting. I can sit here right now and tell you I root for the Eagles to win. I'm an Eagle fan. I just don't do my job when I'm here on Birds 365 or on WIP as an Eagle fan. That's when I step back into my objective persona, which both you two guys are very good at doing. All right, put that aside. Nick Sirianni. Johnny Mac called him, uh, gave him a W today. Do a big W up on the wall with all the offensive coaches that were retained and said, yeah, Keller Moore looked like he was coming in to take over the, the entire shooting match. And he got like two guys that he brought in with him. And other than that, the Eagles coaching staff on the offensive side is staying in place. How big a win for Sirianni is it? I mean, look, it's got to work. I don't think it's a win until it, we see if it works. Okay. Um, I, I think Kellen Moore is a fine hire. He's a very good offensive coordinator. And depending on personalities and assuming he and Nick can get along and, and the room is okay, there is something to be said, I think, at all times in every situation for fresh ideas and creative tension and those sorts of things. I think that's that's good in any organization where – uh, if you have somebody from the outside coming into, say, the Philadelphia Inquirer and is going to uh, help us influence our sports coverage, it's good to have at least one person say, OK, I know I'm not from Philadelphia, but here's my suggestions based on my experiences elsewhere. And I think the same principle would apply to the Eagles. Hey, Nick, you know, we haven't worked together. I know you come from a different school of thought than I do, but here's where the way I'm looking at things and maybe it might be good to try that. So I think there's the potential for this to work, given Moore's presence. Uh, is it a good thing that all these offensive coaches are staying for Nick? I think Nick's got to make it work. I, th I think, yeah. you oh, know, that's, that, that's the thing is, is it a win? It's only a win if the offense looks better than it did last season. Well, by win, Mike, I said, it, you know, when you talk about when it originally happened and Jeffrey Lurie kind of steered them, all right, we need fresh ideas, new ideas. Everybody was on board with Big Banjo, so I kind of put the defense aside. But offensively, you know, Nick rightfully got to ask those questions, you know, about being neutered. Um, you know, what are you going to do here? The office space question. What do you what 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 exactly do you do? Um, all of a sudden, it, it it seems like it was a far more targeted approach by Jeffrey Lurie. And I've heard that term making people uncomfortable, un, uncomfortable, uh, can't get it out. Uncomfortable un, for the sake, yeah. Uncomfort for the sake of, 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 of doing what you just said. Um, that was part of it. No, no question about it. But as I step back and look at the staff, and Kevin Petulo is still there, and Jamal Singleton, we knew Jeff Stoutland wasn't going anywhere, but Aaron Moorhead, Jason Michaels, very close with Nick, on and on and on. Even his former uh, uh, assistants are, are back. It seems like the family's here. Kellen Moore is sort of like the brother-in-law. He's coming in. 
<laughs> and it's more surgical. You're right, obviously. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And Nick is on the, the hot seat, no question about it. But from a, a comfort level, from that neutered level, whatever phrase you want to use to describe it, I don't think that's what happened to Nick Sirianni now. I think people yeah. step back and said, you need fresh ideas. And that really is all that it was. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that, John. It, you can't argue that Nick Sirianni has been set up to fail. I, I think that's kind of what we're saying, right? Yes. That the conditions are here for him as the head coach and as the person whose offense this is supposed to be. The conditions are there for him to succeed. And if he can't succeed in this situation, then Jeffrey Lurie is going to take a long, hard look at whether he ought to be the head coach of this football team. I think that's absolutely fair to say. And in some ways, the fact that they are coming off of, you can make this argument, I'm not sure it's true, but the fact that they are coming off of this kind of collapse as opposed to coming off of a, a birth in the Super Bowl and being five minutes away from winning a championship uh, might be better, right? Like It's like George Clooney says, you don't learn anything from victory or from success. You, you need to go through something like what the Eagles went through to be able to take a step back and reevaluate what you're doing and why you're doing it and whether you need to change it. So in that sense, I think Nick is, po is set up to succeed. It doesn't necessarily mean he's going to, no. but the, the framework is in place. I like to think of myself as a Nick Sirianni supporter and fan and defender more than detractor. And there were a whole bunch of people that were calling for that guillotine you just mentioned uh, that could come down at the end of this year. But I got to ask you about this. Uh, our buddy D Gunn, who I think we all agree has as good contacts in the room as anybody there. And people say stuff to D Gunn. So when he reports something, not hypotheticals, not just put out a poll. Derek Gunn reports stuff when he reports that Nick Sirianni missed Big Dom last year during Big Dom suspension. That's saying something. A, do you buy it? And B, what does it say? A, yes, I buy it. Uh, all you have to do is look at Nick Sirianni on the sideline or just before or just after games to understand that he has struggled a bit at controlling his emotions uh, in the heat of competition. And he sometimes allows his personality to show itself in ways that I don't think is productive, that I don't think are productive. And two, it means to me, he's got to mature. He's got to grow up a little bit as a head coach. I like Nick a lot personally. Uh, it's funny. I say this all the time to people in private. I have a dear, dear friend of mine, one of my closest friends of, close to 30 years, who himself is a coach. He and Nick Sirianni are basically the same person, like personality wise, they even look alike in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And every time I see Nick, I see my friend and my friend needed to learn this lesson, even at a lower level of coaching uh, about allowing his emotions and his personality to kind of overtake him and be counterproductive. And I think this is something that Nick needs to learn. Uh, I think that he needs to understand how to work smarter and more efficiently as opposed to longer and harder. John can attest to this. There were times where Nick would come into media availabilities at the end of this season, and it looked like he hadn't slept in oh, days. Yeah, His eyes were bleary. They were rimmed red. It just looked like he was just totally spent and worn out. And part of maturing as a person in a job, especially a high profile job, is understanding how to work and how to be at your most productive. And Nick taunting Kansas City Chiefs fans and screaming at Hassan Reddick or Devontae Smith during a game, or even during the Super Bowl last year, when the officials are weighing a replay and Nick thinks the Eagles are going to get the call and he's signaling that they're going to get the call and Jalen Hurts reaches and puts, pulls his arm down. That's a sign that to me, Nick needs to mature a little bit as a head coach. You can be authentic and be a professional at the same time. And I think this is a, the place where Nick really needs to grow a little bit. 
Yeah, and I agree. You did a column about that that was uh, uh, on point as well, Mike. So people should check that out at inquire.com. The fact that, you know, it's no sin to be a professional in a professional environment. It makes some sense. And at times, I think Nick straddles that. He does seem to recognize it. He got asked after that Reddick situation um, about his emotions. And he, he admitted, uh, uh, I need to be better in those scenarios. When there's some high pressure errors, they've got to see me, meaning the players, calm and not tense there. With with the Dom part of it, and and Dom's a bigger part of this organization than I think most people realize. He's got, you know, he's bigger than not just literally, but figuratively, bigger than just the director of security. He's a senior advisor to Howard Roseman. He's got a lot of responsibilities. But I will say this. Dom wasn't controlling his emotions with Dre Greenlaw. Yeah, really. um, and, and that's the reason he got suspended. And I'll also say this. When Dom came back in Tampa, it didn't help the Eagles. Uh, it, now, they didn't have A.J. Brown. That, to me, was a bigger detriment. Um, so all I'm saying is I think anyone pointing to the absence of Dom as some kind of causal connection to losing football games, way off base, I think. Yeah, I think that's that's totally fair and true, John. Um, but I, I kind of look at the Sirianni Dom situation in the same way that I do the Jalen Hurts leadership, quote unquote, situation. Right? AJ mentioned this in his interview on WIP the other day about how Jalen was the same guy when we were winning as he was when we were losing. How can you criticize him here and there? Well, different circumstances require different responses from people who are in leadership. There is a time to be stoic and to show your players or your teammates, hey, we got this. You know, I always think of the anecdote uh, about Mike Krzyzewski in that game against Kentucky in 1992 at the Spectrum where, pardon me, the Kentucky kid hits the shot with two seconds left to go and it looks like Duke's going to get knocked out of the NCAA tournament and the players come over to the huddle and the first thing Krzyzewski says to them very calmly is, first things first, we're winning the game. And, you know, kind of meeting the moment with yeah. Calm and himself. I, I do think, though, that circumstances can dictate how a leader is supposed to respond. And I also think that if what we're seeing out of Nick is running uh, and jumping on top of a bench at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis after he beats the Colts and he wants to give it to the Colts fans who are razzing him, um, you know, what aren't we seeing that Dom is yeah. working well, on? Or, yeah. Are, are other and, people and it, in the organization yeah. are saying, Hey Nick, dial it down a notch. And, and it's easy to verbalize it and say, I need to get better, but you got to do it too. Right. Yeah, you got to do it. And, a, and, a, and to a, bring a, it back a, to the Jalen example, like, okay, when the team has lost five out of six games, maybe you being stoic and a tiny bit unapproachable isn't the best way to go. You don't have to be a phony, but you may have to, the time may have to come for you to be a different kind of leader than you have been. All right. Mike Zielski, last one for me this week, both Howie Roseman and uh, Doug Peters, uh, Doug Peterson, Nick Sirianni are going to be available to, Philadelphia media who are in Indianapolis for those who aren't going out. Is it going to be zoom too? Are you guys if not as not far going? as I know? No, no I no think zoom, it'll just be the people uh, who are there. Yeah. Just people there. Just so. people are there. So uh, I'm sure the very good people will be there and ask the right questions, either predict which is the best question asked or what is the best response that follows up thereafter. Will there be any major breaking news out of either Sirianni's and or Roseman's press availability this week in Indy? I don't think so. Howie has become so adept now at like Wonder Woman, Wonder Womaning the questions with her, you know, yeah. she, she just blocks yeah. them like that. Um, <clears throat> that uh, I, I don't know that he'll break any news. That doesn't mean that news won't be broken out there. Um, you know, we'll pay attention to the, the customary insiders to get that. That's the way the media wheel turns in the NFL. We could hear something about Jason Kelsey and his status and his future. We could hear something about Hassan Reddick and whether the Eagles are going to trade him or try to renegotiate the contract to bring him back. I'm sure something else will come out. Um, I I remember, I don't know if John was there 
when this happened. I can remember being at the combine in 2014, and it was right after Nick Foles had had the 27 touchdown, two interception season. And how we spoke about him as if Nick were the prospective franchise quarterback. We have uncovered something, and we think Nick is exactly the kind of quarterback we're going to need to to take us where we want to go. And we found out relatively quickly that Chip Kelly didn't look at Nick Foles exactly the same way. <laughs> no. And no. so I think that Howie may have learned from that and now just keeps <laughs> as much under wraps as he possibly can. At Mike Sealski, make sure you follow Mike on X, uh, Twitter. Uh, it's been killing it at Inquirer.com. Uh, read all his columns there. Tremendous one on A.J. Brown. I guess we talked about the coaching staff a little bit, the offensive coaching staff particularly, and we talked about Jalen Hurts a little bit. Um, the fact that the only changes made were the offensive coordinator and the quarterback's coach, does that indicate to you that the Eagles are really worried about what happened with Jalen Hurts last season, or is it just the fresh ideas aspect of it? I think it's the fresh ideas aspect of it. Um, I don't know how worried they can be, John. I mean, and, and what I mean by that is they are committed to him. That's, yeah. I mean, th yeah. they are all in on Jalen Hurts. So they can't afford to be worried. They, they just have to look at this and say, whatever we think we need to do to maximize Jalen Hurts as a franchise quarterback, we need to do that. And if it, is a change of play calling and scheme and approach, then let's do that. Uh, they can't They can't afford to be worried. He's their guy. Uh, I can't imagine, even if he played terribly again, and I don't think he played terribly last yeah. season. I, I don't. I think it's been overstated a little bit about yeah. how badly he played. Now, he, was he great during the closing stretch of the season? No, he was not. Uh, but that doesn't mean he can't bounce back and be the quarterback he was in 2022. I think some things have to change. I think he has to get healthier, et cetera, et cetera. But they're in with him. And I don't foresee them going through another situation like they did with Carson Wentz, where they say, oh, no, we made a mistake. This guy, it isn't working out, uh, and we got to get rid of him. Um, for one thing, Hurts doesn't want to go anywhere, as far as I can no. tell. Carson wanted to be traded, yeah. and Jalen mm -hmm. doesn't. So, um, no. yeah, I mean, like I said, they can't afford to be worried. And oh, by the way, Jalen got Albert O back. Big Albert O. That's a big one. <laughs> That's a biggie. Uh, Mike Salski, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for jumping in with us. Love listening to you and Mac on Saturdays. Uh, like John said, some very good columns of late. Thank you very much for that and appreciate your sharing with us today. Anytime, guys. You're the best. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Mike. Inquire, lead commentator, lead columnist, and also uh, contributor on WIP on Saturdays. Yeah, he, he he brings up a good point with Chandler Hurts and the fact that. But I, the one thing I would take uh, exception with is that uh, the Eagles didn't want to give up on Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz gave up on the Eagles. They were going to move forward when Nick Sirianni was hired. It was with the idea: all right, we're going to get Carson Wentz back on track mainly because of the salary and all that stuff. And Carson was like, no, I'm not coming back and kind of forced himself out. So they even wanted to double down with Carson Wentz one more time and try it again. I don't know that you and I have ever discussed this. Mm -hmm. um, before he blew up and basically blew himself up, if he was smart enough to realize it, and I think he probably was, um, you think Doug was good with Wentz coming back the next year? Or do you think he was ready to move on? Um, yeah, I, I think another underreported thing is Doug was a, a big fan of Jalen Hurts, but I, I do think he was okay with trying it one more time with, with Carson Wentz. There was a bit of a, um, uh, in a disconnect when he benched him. No question about that. There was a point they weren't even speaking. Carson was so upset. So, but I think he understood they were going to run it back and try to rescue Carson Wentz, but then it never got to that point. Never got there, uh, right? Yeah, but um, I, I think if if Doug, if the stuff that happened with the assistant coaches hadn't happened, D Doug came back, I think there would have been a conversation had about listen, maybe we just need to go in another direction. Yeah, really it, it could have happened Hurts. because Doug really did like Jalen Hurts. Right and, now, um, the, the same thing would have been facing the decision that they eventually had to make. 
it was the largest dead cap hit in the history of the yes. National Football League at that point. So Doug would have had to been making his argument to get rid of a car that went against that. Well, the Eagles did it anyway, but their hand was forced by the quarterback himself rather than the head coach. Um, very interesting. It's The stuff could have happened differently. We know what has happened and that the Eagles right now are, as Mike said, they're married to Jalen Hurts. I give you when we come back, I'll quickly get one last point in. Guy did a really good come. You know, I uh, whined and moaned about the guy from the 33rd team and his ranking yes. of the quarterbacks. You last did a week. good column. Yeah. I got a good one. I'll give it to you when we come back. We got a All couple right. minutes left here on Bird Street 65.